Hello, everyone. Guess what? It's that time again of the week. What, what time of the week is that? Well, it is the Hood Rat Strategist Radio Program, only on 89.1 WIDR Kalamazoo. Uh, this is a show where we come on every week. We talk about politics. We talk about activism. We talk about what's going on in the world. And in general, we call out the establishment on its BS. As always, the following thoughts, views, and opinions are not necessarily those of 89.1 FM, WIDR Kalamazoo, or Western Michigan University. So, we got a lot to talk about on the show tonight. I mean, I think I'll start by saying um, um, uh, Michigan has been in the news a lot this week, and and not for good reason. Sure has. (laughs) Oh, oh uh, introductions? Yeah, it's like, what, so, what are those? You don't need intros. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Get yeah, yeah, out of yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, let's uh, real quick, because we've got we've got an extra guest, an extra special guest on the show today. Um, it's a dear colleague, Nora. And, and Nora, why don't you tell little people, the little people, the people, <laughs> who may or may not be, be little, of various sizes and statures. Um, tell the people at home about yourself and... Uh, but before we like start diving into the meat and potatoes of the discussion, oh, my name is Nora Getz. I... Hello, hello. Yeah. Yeah, speak into the mic. Yes. Into the mic. Yeah. Don't, don't be afraid to make out with the filter. <laughs> yeah, 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 a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, my name is Nora Getz. I'm a good friend of Andy's and these two gentlemen who are who joined us in the studio today. Uh, I roll with his group, uh, Lake Michigan Revolutionary Coalition, as it's recently renamed. I also work IT at Intercare Community Health Network. They provide um, health clinics to um, uh, communities that don't have them uh, in west in areas of West Michigan, like generally to the west of Grand Rapids and Kalamazoo, and like a lot of rural areas, a lot of migrant farm workers. I also uh, recently graduated Kalamazoo College with a double major in computer science and women, gender, and sexuality. And I'm continuing to study at KVCC to uh, learn IT, get those certifications in. Yeah. So I'm a computer girl. I'm also a trans woman. That's not very common in the tech industry, but we've got to start somewhere, don't we? Yep. And I, yeah. mean, I mean, that's the, the uh, um, I, I would say like uh, gender studies in tech. That's that's basically the future, isn't it? Like <laughs> uh, uh, more or less. Um, anyway, uh, hope spe- so. Yes. Uh, uh, so I think like the first thing we're really gonna hop off into is you know big, uh, big big march over the weekend here in Kalamazoo. Uh, the the uh, women's oh I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I, usually I'm just like ah, these are my co-hosts. You know them. Um, I didn't get they, they I, I didn't get an poly. intro either, man. Yeah, so I like, mean, just, like, just, just calm so, calm down. I'm, I'm cool. I'm cool. I'm All right, here are these guys who are here every week. <laughs> <laughs> yelling about politics with me, but no, it's Lawrence and Luke, of course. And I don't know, you got I don't know if you guys have actually ever told the people about yourselves. That's what, what y'all do and stuff. Lawrence, I, Luke, who are you? Uh, I'm a guy uh, who does this most every week. Yep. That's that's who I am. I, yep. I'm angry and I shout about politics a lot. Currently wearing a kilt. I, I, yes. <laughs> yes. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah. An unnecessary uh, addition, but yes. Yep. <laughs> Negative 25 outside. He's wearing a kilt. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm man enough. Are you? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not about being man enough. I'm, I, I, I like circulation. It's not, it's not, not that much. Okay. There's, there's degrees. Okay. Yeah. I wouldn't say this is kilt or skirt weather. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, you know, everybody knows it's me, Lawrence. Hey, everybody. Hey, what's up? Mm-hmm. I'll talk. I'll talk about myself later. But first, let's talk about this women's march. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about a couple, couple of these different issues. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, talk about Michigan. How Michigan's been in the news from? Oh yeah. From yeah. Uh, crazy right wing. Uh, oh, the CNN guy. Yeah, oh, crazy right wing. Yeah, well, I mean, we'll, Trump supporter. We'll, we'll talk about that. I think first, let's let's hone in uh, on the women's march. Uh, just because uh, you know, uh, so. About 3,000 people showed up. It's like, I, from what oh, I heard, there's yeah. only about a grand last time. And I, I saw uh, Erica Chenoweth, who, uh, she is the author of a fantastic book called uh, um, Why Civil Disobedience Works. And uh, she crunched the numbers, said there were about 4.2 million people 
participated in Women's March on Sunday. This year? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's that's about as much as uh, last time. Maybe a little bit more. Yeah. I think, that's um, a, I think it's a little bit more. I think, too, it was also spread out a lot more because, you know, you had them in the big city hubs last time. This time, from what I hear, like, there were a lot more satellite marches. Um, there's this one town in, like, I think it was... Uh, um, South Dakota or something like a town of 63 people and half the town showed up to the, <laughs> to the city's women's march. That's inspiring. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think let's talk a little bit like, uh, you know, both me and Nora were there um, and there are some criticisms of the women's march, both nationally and locally that have, that have cropped up. But um I like let's let's start off just talking about like you know what what did um, what is was your overall take of this year's march and I'll, I'll start with you Nora and we'll kind of bounce off of that. Yeah, so um, it was good to have a march here locally. Uh, it didn't feel like there's a lot to it. Like I enjoyed it. I had a good time. We marched from uh, Western's campus to Bronson Park and then back. Like there wasn't any speeches, surprisingly. Nor was there, like, I guess, a specific unifying message. There's a lot of different messages on the signs. In fact, I have a lot of them uh, I can go over in just a second. Oh, oh yeah, please. <laughs> but. but I uh, marched with uh, my housemate Morgan, who is uh, a chapter member of one of the other women's marches, women's march chapters back in somewhere in North Michigan. I don't remember exactly. And a couple of our mutual friends, the McLeans, you know them? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I-, I saw the pictures. They, they had some great signs, too. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, my sign that I carried uh, on one side it said, uh, "Trans women are real women, real people, real revolutionaries." I'm really proud of that one. The other side refers to um, the whole foundation of excellence thing because oh, oh, yeah. the, whole, the fact that we sold our city to a rapist in mid-August. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag me too. Yeah, yeah, no, I, that that might like you and I think Abby probably had my favorite signs from the march. Oh, really? Like, I'm yeah. flattered. Yeah, yeah, because uh, yeah, again, that's something. Um, I don't know when Bill Parfett's day of reckoning will come, but it's long overdue. Uh, let's just say that. Um, but it, yeah, you want to find out more about that? We actually did a whole show about it. But um, he uh, uh, he's one of the main beneficiaries of the Excellence Foundation, and there was some very heinous allegations made about him, where he basically like he basically had a kept woman um, that he not only like violated over the span of several years, but um, she got pregnant and he gave her hush money and um, they ended up settling out of court. But um, yeah, very, uh, if you read the court documents, it's not for, don't do it or do it on an empty stomach. Cause it's, uh, um, uh, anyway, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Nora, but um, no, it's fine. Yeah, this give, is give this people stuff that people context. need to know about. And thankfully there were at least a couple people that asked questions about my sign. Some people were confused at first cause it's, you know, they, You'd think that people might hear about it if their city was bought by a rapist, but uh, evidently not as much. But it was good that people asked questions. I, you know, told them the you know sto- same story that you just relayed about Bill Parfett and his role in the uh, the so-called Excellence Foundation. And uh, oh yeah, I was talking about signs. So the other signs that Pete, me, and my crew had. Um, Morgan's had it just said hashtag me on two on it. The McLeans had one that said end white feminism. And mm. the other sign says, I am not free until every woman is free. Both, I think, uh, you know, are essential, are essential nowadays, especially with, you know, what we're about to go into talking about what the march did right and didn't do right. I, I do have some nice constructive criticism. Uh, do you want to get into that? What's a, yeah, a specific yeah. I word? Mean, you know, like, I, I think, like, the big, big things to hit on are, you know, I mean, uh, the, the, the women's march was, was pretty white. And I'm gonna say they're not as egregious. There are some other places where, like, I, I heard some some horror stories. Uh, I have a lot of activist uh, comrades over in Philly. Oh yeah, and they uh, they literally like invited the cops to run security. Which, if you're part of, say, like Black Lives Matter or any other marginalized groups that do not have a good history with the police, no, it's probably not to run it. It's not good to run it with like police officers. Like you're doing like event style security, like it was like a festival or something. Um, and uh, you know, I heard another one. Um, there was this nat- native indigenous woman who literally got pulled off the stage 
I just started, started talking about police brutality. Oh my god! Um, this was in Philly as well. Not that wasn't in Philadelphia. I, I can't remember exactly where that was, but I it was in my news feed uh, the other day. But there, there's a there is a big problem with uh, you know last year. I think there were there was a lot like leading up to the women's march, and I kind of took it with a grain of salt because you know you had organizers like Linda Sarsour, um, you know, etc. Um, but there was this word that like this is going to be like kind of a white woman's march, and you know I gotta say in in some ways this year it was even a little bit more pronounced. Uh, and you know I was talking with, with you, Lawrence, about this the other day, how. You know, there's some history behind this, and you know, I think a lot of a lot of like these organizers around the women's the set, women's marches and like the satellite ones. You know, not all of them are guilty of this, but a lot of them are organized by white women who don't understand the intersectional issues when it comes to you know non-white women, trans women, um, and uh, um, you know, again, it's kind of like I saw a sign somewhere. Uh, from one of the women's marches, if Hillary were president, we'd be at brunch by now. Oh and I'll tell you, there, there, there's. <laughs> let me, let me, let me, let me chime yeah, in. Chime yeah, in on please. The, the, the whole idea about uh, uh, white women feminism uh, in, in or just progressivism in matter is a similar thing that uh, Margaret Luther King talked about. That the white moderate uh, that says that we stand with you in principle. But not in practice. We can't. We can't. Uh, we can't back you because we don't like your procedure or po- or uh, or how you choose to do your um, your activism. It, it is, and it has this historical context during the during the women's suffrage movement. Black women were not allowed to even stand on the same stage as a lot of the uh, a lot of the white progressive women that were doing the, the that caused these protests. A lot of the black women still had to use the back part of the entrance. They had to they if they were organizing or something, their names wasn't put on the uh, put it on. Uh, given their information was not given, they weren't given credit. So it it goes back to the to the a lot of the foundation of our country that you have people who have power or the people who are organizing not being able to see outside their bubble because they're because they think that they're being inclusive yet they are um, neglecting the same people who they need support from. I call it the Hillary Clinton phenomenon. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's, 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 that's uh, uh, from the, or, or again, the, the, it's, the, it's the white moderate phenomenon. You think that you're being progressive, yet you forget to include women or other minorities from Black Lives Matter or, or the transgender community. And you forget to include them in the discussion of how to organize or how to reach out. But you still need their support when it comes down to the nitty and gritty. So that's that it, it, you need. It's it's one thing to have to have a, a, a minority face as the face of the company or something or others. It's another thing to have it behind the scenes. In the in actually determining some of the policy and structure, those are those are some of the the bigger issues of it. I, I mean, not to mention the fact that uh, my criticism there is like when when we start talking about putting diversity on the face of it, you have to make sure that it's not just the face of it, which is the thing that is potent that that that's actually one of the biggest struggles we have on at least our national political scale from the left and our struggle to uh, create this change and and, and get this progress that we'd like is we have a quote-unquote left party that uh, believes in diversity in appearance, but they don't really believe in diversity of ideas. They don't really believe in uh, hosting or being a platform to ideas that challenge uh, what it is to be uh, like what the status qu- to challenge what the status quo is as one would expect from a progressive left party uh, it's one of the reasons why like the personally the more I think about it one of the reasons why conservatives have to exist is to keep progressives from going off the deep end with uh, exactly uh, just going straight out to 
uh, the ide- the uh, logical conclusion of the of the ideological idea. Um, it, the, it requires it does like even then, uh, <coughs> it's a weight, not a. It, it's an it's a weight, but it's it's not a, uh, like wall that will completely stop what will be progress is inevitable um but go ahead nora yes um if i may i don't want to get too far off topic because i am trying to talk about the um the match in, the the march in kalamazoo itself so yeah. uh, based off like a lot of what lawrence has said we could see um like some of that i think uh i guess the main reason the march and it turned out the way that it did was it because it was kind of uh organized like just about a month ahead of time which was still in the middle of the holiday season so i actually talked with uh, one of the main organizers of this year's Women's March on the phone before coming in here to, you know, figure out exactly what happened with this. Uh, they, they're not people who, like, we normally see run, rolling around with um, the same activist circles that we might be familiar with. Like, it was uh, posted, I think, on uh, Pro K Zoo's page maybe once. I didn't really see it on uh, discussed on DSA or Black Lives Matter or anything like that. But it was kind of put together spontaneously. She, from what she told me, that it was a lot of the same people who organized the March for Science and the original organizer who single-handedly, I might add, organized the, the Women's March last year. Which is, which, which I'll also add, is also like, you know, kind of impressive to do even like, you know, something haphazardly that quick and have a big turnout of a thousand to up to a thousand eight hundred, then add another thousand or so on top of that. But, um, let's see, what else do I have in my notes? Just, just, just one quick thing. Just one quick thing, not to interrupt, but um, like when we when we're talking about this on a national scale, when you hear white, uh, when you hear white women feminists or feminists talk about something as simple as the uh, uh, women not getting paid their whole dollar, right? Mm-hmm. Well, so, well, uh, there was uh, data that came out that yes, if you are a white woman. Yes, you get paid 75 cents on the dollar. If you are a black woman, you get paid 54 cents on the dollar. If you are a Latino woman, you get paid 62 cents on the dollar in comparison to your white male counterparts. The thing is, is that 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 breakdown, you never hear. Mm, yeah, that, that's right. That type of, that type of, uh, mm. in that distinction to understand that besides just the gender equality that race plays a factor into that as well that the um, that when you're on a on a nas- not just on a national scale I don't I, I don't know too many of the details of the organization of the women's March here but I'm for speaking on a, on a national scale you have to take those other perspectives into consideration it's be- the reason because you need those groups not just exactly. women but other but men as well to back you cuz that's how change happens change doesn't happen because you're we're, we're in an echo chamber of our own bubble change happens when you are inclusive to everyone around you that also means you have to be inclusive to everybody's perspective and you know like kind of bouncing off that you know Nora so you know, I, I kind of wanted to like get your perspective too. You know, because uh, there, I, I mean, again, every March is a little bit different, and you know, this is also the same day. Like, there was a viral image going around of of this this woman who was a, who was a turf, which as you as you told me at the bar the mm. other day, it's like it's like women who don't like trans people. What does it stand for? And it was very obvious, but I <laughs> wait, 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 hold on, what? Uh, t- okay. So okay, so I'm gonna explain this to I, you. I'm, yeah, I'm so <laughs> yeah, confused. Yeah. Please. So there's this there's this uh, specific type of feminist called a turf, and that's like an anagram T E R F. That stands for uh, trans exclusionary radical feminist, which means specifically that um, they believe that like um, it's about like biological sex as it's so called and you know people with penises oppress people with vaginas and that's that's the end of that and it's like kind of a deni- it's kind of a denial of you know my existence as a woman I feel like and also like it's even like just b- beyond being trans misogynistic also like regular misogynistic in a way because it like reduces women in a way to like their genitals and other uh, sex characteristics which you know, feminists should absolutely be against. There weren't any at the uh, Kalamazoo March, as far as I could tell, which was really thankful. 
you know, there's a there's a bunch of um obviously there were the pussy hats and there was the um you know uh what's the word exactly? Like, uh, you know, vagina puns on the signs, but oh, I wouldn't yeah. like that's, <laughs> say that's turfy per se. Because, like, it is still, like, the Women's March is still about, uh, you know, a, a large, a lot of it has to do with reproductive rights, but let's not stray too far away. That I, Terps don't the, like trans people. I mean, no, there, uh, on, the, on the national level, there was a lot of people, there was a lot of different... Uh, there was many women that were marching for multiple different things. I saw in I saw in California, there were people that that were around some of the young Turks, and some of them had signs about getting money out of politics. It was not just about reproductive rights; it was also talking about uh, 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 the uh, the inequality, wealth inequality in America. Mm-hmm. There was a lot of signs that was talking about health care, and oh, like not yeah. just not just mm-hmm. not just in not just in California, but all over. So women's issues, and this is the thing that. I think pisses me off when it comes to Democrats and also Republicans. When you're, when it comes to policy, policy, when you're voting to not raise the minimum wage, you're voting against women because half the country makes less than thirty thousand dollars a year, and the majority of that is single mothers. The majority of those who make less than thirty thousand dollars a year are single mothers. So you're voting against women when you are voting to um, to not give. Uh, to not give free college and tuition to to Americans, the majority of people who are going to college are women, especially Black women. But college is college tuition has gotten so high that it's that it's rivaling mortgage, uh, like uh, the, the college debt. Uh, my bad. College debt is is risen to the point where it's rivaling people's mortgages. So when you're voting, so when your policy are uh, your policies that you are advocating for, those issues affect not just normal, regular, organic women, as you called it, mm-hmm. but also trans women and transgen- transgenders as, and, as well. And you have to, you have to be aware of that. And th- in our in our political climate, a lot of our politicians are not like they they yeah. they, they don't understand. They, no, they they it's not that they don't know. Because I, I disagree with that. They know, but they're paid not to. Mm-hmm. They're paid to go against the interest of the American people. And when you're going against the interest of universal health care, free college and tuition, uh, raising the minimum wage, uh, ending the drug war, you know, those policies disproportionately affect all of us, but especially affect women. As so, I mean, like, yeah, that's why you will have. That's why. That's why I was seeing when I was looking looking up the women's market. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's exactly correct. Like, of course, I'm trans, and I still want living wage. I want health care. I want free college. Like, these are things that would be that would uplift wanna, my community tremendously. Right? No, right. You don't want to be you don't you don't want to be redlined because you're transgender. I yeah, mean, of course you know? not. <laughs> uh, it was a great thing uh, that. The best thing, the best answer that I've seen so far, or at least the best kind of like, uh, nice little snippet that kind of sums it all up, is that uni- uh, a universal solution is the solution that helps everyone. It, it, like, uh, that is so rising tides. Things, point. things like yeah. you, un- like a universal free health care that helps everybody. Right. Uh, free college, like. Uh, free higher education that helps everybody and when everybody is being helped overall society uh, the economy like any kind of measure measurement tool you want to take to it is goes on an increase not a decrease so why aren't we fighting to help people what why why are we actively working against helping people well this is uh, something I'd like to go back to with um the, a bunch of different signs being about different topics, whether it's the environment, whether it's about the dreamers, right. like all these were at the women's march. Like there was, there was certainly a unified, uh, you know, liberal leftist uh, a voice at the women's march. But like I guess the, at the one in Kalamazoo, it didn't seem like it was uh, organizing around anything specific. Perhaps due to a lack of um, speeches, other than like one at the beginning and uh, at the campus and one at Bronson Park. But. Uh, do, like do the people are there. The, the, the consciousness do, of intersectionality isn't there within mm-hmm. a lot of the people who do come out to these marches. 
It's just not always intentionally organized in such a way by the organizers, either because it was spontaneous or because of other reasons. In fact, uh, the organization that, like, you know, Women's March Incorporated and, you know, operates in New York City, run by uh, Linda Sarsour and the rest, like, made it put out a statement that, <coughs> pardon me, <clears throat> they put out a statement that um, they appreciate all the people coming out like in uh, slightly bigger numbers than before. In fact, uh, in California and Los Angeles, that was probably the, the that biggest march in America, biggest maybe even the world. Uh, mm-hmm. Not so not so clear on the statistics outside of the U.S. Didn't quite have time to research, but yeah, they, they uh, you know called that out specifically that we do need to make that a central part of our organizing. And on the call with the organizers of this year's Women's March, they've definitely learned next time to uh, consult more people within the activist community, especially um, groups led and centered by people of color. It, it's just mostly the, like, you know, the reason why there wasn't as much of an emphasis on intersectionality from the ground up was like, you know, just the, the people, the science march, which like the people who organize the science march, I mean... I'm not super familiar with them, but like I know at least a couple people who organized this march, so they're the same people. But I guess it's still kind of like its own like bubble in a sense that it hasn't, if it hasn't been an actor act- interacting with um, these other activist groups so much. However, um, one of the people that I also talked to was one of the founding members of Pro K Zoo, even though she's not involved with them anymore due to other reasons. But that's another topic. Uh, I can go over some of the signs that we saw in uh, the Kalamazoo March, if you'd like. Oh, yeah, please. Please do. All right. All right, so um, here's some of my favorites. Uh, These ones, like, do go over all sorts of issues. Um, One said, it's not about bathrooms the same way it wasn't about drinking fountains. Mm, Yeah, yeah. (laughs) No longer accepting the things I can't change, but changing the things I can't accept. Support women's rights over corporate sleaze. Hey, there we go. Yeah, and, uh, and that, yeah, and that, say, that. say no to neoliberal feminism. Good. <laughs> yes. Amen. I rock for that. I rock for that. So bad even the introverts are here. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, by the way, y'all, you don't know, like, y'all hear me talk a lot on the radio when I'm out in public. Well, I, me and Lawrence can both speak to this. Like, unless you get to start talking about politics, we're, we're kind of like wallflowers. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, I, I'll spark up a conversation yeah. with anybody. Yeah, but, yeah, most, yeah. but most of the times, like, when people see me, I have my headphones on. Like, yeah, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm zoning out, listening to my own music. Yeah. Like, I'm usually in my own world mm-hmm. until <laughs> it's time to interact with other humans. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> but but I mean I think the thing that the, I think the thing that uh, what you were just talking about with um, the theme of the Women's March I don't want people to just be angry just to be angry. The whole the, the sign that we talked oh, yeah. about the, the sign that we talked about before about if Hillary was um, here we'll be at brunch right now. Mm. That that yeah. that mindset is the reason why we're in the situation that we have been. It's the reason why the culture of of um, toxic masculinity or things like that has persisted because things cannot. The, what is done by the majority um, uh, or people that are in power has to be either co-signed or uh, can only exist with avid complacency complacency by those who are around you know you can't like yeah. like for example you Har- like uh, uh, Harvey Weinstein could not be could not have done what he did for years if there wasn't other women that were there that were complacent around That's oh right. yeah you know what I'm saying yeah. same, it's, it's same same thing with uh, you could put Roger Ailes Bill Cosby you could go down that list and you know I'd, li- I'd like to kind of you know jump off something similar to that and I think this this is a problem with you know, so, so, like you know, not just activist Kalamazoo, but also, um, cert, like certain political organizers um, who are not quite on that progressive tip yet. Where um, I was, I was having a, a, a discussion on pro K Zoo community <laughs> discussion <laughs> with a certain someone, uh, and you know, like we we, we kind of joke around sometimes, centrist K Zoo, um, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, like they defined the establishment as old white men, and to our credit, white men are are the we're the best at coming up with destructive, horrible policies <laughs> that uh, that negatively affect everyone. But that doesn't mean other people can't get on. You know, like look at our last good example: last three Secretary of States, women, 
Um, one of whom, Condoleezza Rice, was was an African American, and um, I mean they they didn't start any wars, right? You know they didn't do anything <laughs> um, <laughs> like that uh, in, in you know oh, why, perpetuate why, imperialism why, or why, 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 is, why, is why, Johnny Kerry an honorary woman now? Oh, is that oh, a thing? <laughs> oh, I, oh, sorry, I forgot. About that. John Kerry that, was in there. Shade. Wait, wait, there, there, like, let, let's not let's not forget that there was a black woman just like Bernie Sanders that that voted against the Iraq War. There were there were uh, in the Afghanistan War. There there were women who spoke up against it and they were punished for it. Um, the anchor uh, the anchor on CNN that that me and Andy talked about. Oh, we I think well, we're gonna team. dive into that no, no, in a minute. But, no, no, but yeah. I was saying like she was at the time. She voted. She spoke out and made a speech on air about not going into Afghanistan and Iraq. What happened? The establishment, which MSNBC was owned by GE at the time, not only took her off air, they did not let her out of her contract, and then they put her office into a closet. <laughs> and then, and she she endured all of that, got out of her contract, went to CNN, and had some of the best interviews and debates on policy that CNN has had in years. That was back in 2012. And she's still one of the greatest news anchors that's on TV. Mm -hmm. She's one of the few that will actually call the establishment for for their BS. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, there are women who are to their credit that are, that stand for the right things and they were, um, and they were berated. They were uh, they were uh, they were knocked down, but they still push and fight for right policies. Now you also have people who are also complacent. Mika Bazinski is complacent, <laughs> like, you know what I'm yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like, but but you have that but you have that dichotomy, and we have to understand that um, as 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 some of my uh, black friends and family say, just because they say they just because they look like me or they are around me doesn't mean that they're for me yeah and mm. I, I kind of wanted to uh, I'll ask you Nora you know as someone who's right here at that that particular uh, what, what's the word junction I, I guess for you. I'm sorry. Uh, um, where like I, you're part of like this anti-establishment progressive movement also identity politics and there's kind of this confluence here where you know uh the progressive movement itself is extremely intersectional, but there's still this establishment that is kind of trying to use our generation's weapons against us in the sense that they're trying to, you know, shield bad policy with, you know, this intersectional face. And just kind of like, if you could talk a little bit about, like, how you feel about that, how maybe you think that that intersects with uh, the issues we're talking about with this Women's March and, and such. Hmm, that's a good point. Um... Yeah, I guess we have seen it like used by the political establishment pretty extensively. Like the um, the DNC purge of the progressives from the Rules Committee, for example, is probably the, the best example. Like they said, it was for diversity, and they had a couple diverse choices in, in terms of demographics, sure. But they did also like you know kick out um, a Jewish trans lady who is oh, yeah. formerly the highest elected uh, trans person in any office in this country, and like they kicked out also. Um, Two Middle Eastern Americans who were, uh, you know, a big part of, uh, who were on the uh, whatever. It wasn't just the rules committee, was it? No, it was. It was not. It was the rules and bylaws committee, and it was also the fi- uh, the finances. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, that makes um, sense. Was, so um, they come and paying their consultants. Yeah. yeah. It, um, <laughs> it's uh, I forgot, Doctor, because um, one of one of them, Doctor Zombie, Doctor, uh, I've got his first name, Zombie. He was also on the uh, on the uh, Democratic uh, Reform Committee. Yeah, as well. yeah. Mm-hmm. Jim, Zo- Jim Zombie. Jim Zombie. I think so. Yeah. It's, it's uh, it was uh, he was also on the uh, yeah the Unity and Reform Commission. Yeah. As well, and he was kicked off of the uh, for diversity reasons, <laughs> quote unquote. Like yep. the, the 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 diversity. And this this is the thing that pisses me off. When people use the word diversity, and uh, you see companies, you see companies, Fortune 500 companies, say that they have nothing but diversity, but when it comes to the board meetings and stuff, it's all old white people. Mm-hmm. It's all old white mm-hmm. men. Yeah. But when they but they say their company is diverse, <laughs> you know, it's like it, it's not diverse when it comes to who's controlling the levers of power. It's diverse in who's working in shipping out our products. 
All right. <laughs> so, Nora, uh, just I, I want to make sure, kind of cap off what you're saying. I think we, we should probably go to a break. Oh, yeah. um, it's about 5:40. Got <laughs> <laughs> We are we always yeah. running over on breaks. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> every yeah. time. <laughs> like, it's like, oh, supposed yeah, to be well, every half hour. Like, yeah, we're, yeah. We're, we're, it's like, yeah, we're supposed to have a break. Yeah, we're supposed to have a break. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Ah, uh, yes. Okay, so the Women's March. Um, the Women's March in Kalamazoo, the, there could have been more done, but overall it was it, it was a good event for the most part, I feel like. They they did a good job, all things considered, giving the, you know, the time frame and the holidays and, the, you know, working within their bubble and their limits. But there's room for improvement, and they're open to it, which is a good sign. And so I'm interested to see where the next one comes up. Do you know where you can send your cr- uh, criticisms or critiques or how to help organize help with the next uh, march? You know I who? will get back to you on that. Um, okay. I can, uh, you know, contact one of the organizers on the break. Got you. Yeah, and uh, a couple we're, of them, a couple put, of them, I'm sure, are listening right should, now. Hello. Yeah, yeah. We, should, we should put out some of that. Inf- we need to put out that some of that information so uh, so people will know. Uh, if they, if you are, if you want to get involved, and you should get involved, it doesn't matter if you're a woman or not. Uh, you can be a man and be involved. You can be whatever and be involved. But being involved is what matters. Yes. Yeah. And I would almost say, like, if I could just throw one thing out there right now, I think the biggest thing that needs to happen with these women mar- women's marches, I, I get the feeling it's going to be a recurrent thing every year, is be more intentional about making sure those people stay involved. Because I, I do mm, feel there's a lot yeah. of people who just they show up to that march and. I don't know what they're doing the rest of the year, but, you know, like, be really intentional. Here are all these groups in town that you can work with out front. Uh, you know, uh, Project X, I, Hosecha, I, I have a uh, question. so on and so forth. I do have a quick question. Yeah. Was any of the uh, Democratic uh, uh, run, uh, people who are running to get Fred up in seat? Was any of them at the Oh, march? yeah. They were all there, actually. They were all <laughs> there? Uh, well, well, Epi- well, Epony and Garrett was over in St. Joe, and I, I actually, I think I saw all five other ones in k Oh, no way. Yeah. I didn't, actually. I was closer to the yeah. front of the line. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but uh, various points, I saw. <laughs> okay, okay. Because I, I was about to say, yeah. if you if you running, mm-hmm. you weren't there. <laughs> It's a problem. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, <man>, a problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to hop back into the discussion. This is the Hood Rat Strategist radio program only on 89.1 WIDR Kalamazoo, your only source for political revolution. rather prominent issue amongst the student body of Western. The Invisible Need Project is a multifaceted initiative that's aimed to help struggling students. Every two weeks, generous people donate their food to the pantry located in the Font Student Service Buildings or other drop-off locations. All you need to do is grab a reusable bag and grab whatever food you need to help sustain yourself. If anyone's unsure when their next meal will be, or if you have a little extra food you'd be willing to donate, the food pantry is your place. If you're looking to help donate, become a volunteer, or just learn more, call 269-387-4742 or email dosa-imp at wmich.edu for details. Are you trying to get your local Kalamazoo business name out to the WMU and greater Kalamazoo communities? Why not do so while supporting Radio Evolution through underwriting and donations? For more information, please visit WIDRFM.org.
Hello, everyone. We are back. This is the Hood Rat Strategist radio program, only on 89.1 WIDR Kalamazoo. So, um, I guess what I'm about to... Uh, Nor- Nora, uh, I'm sorry, did you motion at me, or was that... Uh, <laughs> um, uh, you, you finish that thought. I'll give me, give me just a second. Okay. Um, so I, I guess we want to transition a little bit into, so, you know, one of the things I was surprised that there wasn't really, a, you know, a speech directed about this, um, the single biggest tectonic cultural shift that has happened since last year's March has been, uh, it's, we'll talk about women's issues, is uh, Me Too, Time's Up. Um and, uh, you know, uh, I think, like, we were talking a little bit, well, a lot, sorry. Uh, about two weeks ago, uh, we had a, a very uh, kind of unique program. We talked about not only, like, Me Too, but in the context of, like, male behavior. And uh, uh, I, I, I kind of talked about some of my own uh, uh, whack behavior in the past. Uh, and... Uh, uh, well, first I want to kind of pivot to or throw it to Nora and kind of like what 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 your perception of was, uh, you know, kind of the lack of talk about that in the movement. And then we, we had a couple of like current events things that we wanted to touch on. But you mean uh, to talk about we, Me Too and the women's movement as a whole or in? Oh, the, I guess like at the march, like, you know, do you, I, I kind of wish there would have been, pe- you know, people speaking out about that. Yeah. But, uh, well, um, at that Another thing that like I was going to go over um, is there right if I finish uh, a lot of the stuff I want to oh, talk about. Please, okay, please, yes. please do. I'm sorry. Yeah. To, to, fit, to, to you know cl- close the box on uh, you know this whole discussion about the women's march, uh, specifically the one locally, is um, like with, with it if there were speeches, it would have been a great opportunity to discuss about topics and like you know put all the energy of the three thousand people we got to march for one day to like specific issues like the Me Too movement. Of course, there was no no shortage of signs for. Um, uh, with you know saying me too i went with uh somebody who had that themselves <clears throat> but um it's it's still very prevalent in the the women's movement as a whole and you saw it a lot in a bunch of other uh women's march that were women's marches that were organized a bit i'm going to uh i want to touch very briefly on like i guess the anniversary of j20 as well oh yes that's right yeah um we, we didn't really talk too much about that and that's that's also very important to touch on so um recently the department of justice uh, dismissed the charges of 129 uh protesters the original j uh, j20 in dc Ooh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. they might have faced uh, otherwise up to 60 years in prison i'm sure there's still a couple a few hundred others that are still awaiting um the, their own fair deck to come in. Fingers crossed. I don't know if those specific people got caught doing property damage or whatever. Because in, ter- in terms of demonstrations, like there there was definitely some property damage and some like I guess people damage. Let's say, which is v- are both very different things. Uh, and however yeah. you feel that's justified is uh, uh, as, depends. As someone who was who was actually on the ground there, and I, I just want to say like I lucked out a lot. I was about a block and a half away from the kettling and the mass arrests. Uh, so like it was just by by my own fortune and and uh, um, just where I was at the time, I I did not uh, end up getting arrested. But um, honestly, like the actual property damage that occurred wasn't extremely severe. There's some knocked over newsstands. Uh, somebody did light a limousine on fire, which is very. <laughs> whoever owns a limousine, you can get a new one. Um, they probably have fancy insurance on it already. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, I will say I was feeling a little groggy at one point. You know, there's some like tear gas and stuff going off. I was like, Ooh. hey comrades, who wants some coffee? What do you know? Starbucks symbol of capitalism. <laughs> uh, some smashed windows. Could not uh, uh, perk myself up for the for the rest of the uh, pro- protesting and rabble rousing <laughs> of the day, but um, uh, yeah. So sorry, I don't mean to. No, it's it's fine. Uh, so like, I guess uh, I wanted to very briefly compare um, the march in Kalamazoo to like um, I was at a J20 rally in uh, Grand Rapids, and it was uh, it was very small. Like it, especially compared to the women's march, there's probably a total of like I would estimate uh, 30 people there. It was organized primarily by the the Socialist Alternative Party in Grand Rapids, which is technically different from the Socialist Party of Michigan. That's that's a whole other thing. Mm-hmm. And um, they did contact other groups. They had a speaker from uh, the Grand Rapids Rapid Response to ICE. They oh, this is the one in Grand Rapids. Yes, right? there. Okay. 
It was the, it was the closest uh, J20 like directly related event as far as I'm aware. I mean, there could have been one in Battle Creek for all I know, but Grand Rapids is around where I grew up, so like I felt like <clears throat> it was important to go out there and make a stand against fascism because um, J J20 as opposed to the Women's March is uh, primarily an anti-fascist and anti-capitalist uh, march. Mm -hmm. Although there's like you know there's still plenty of pussy hats there. I was one of them. I, I do find it personally empowering. Um, they uh, as they invited people. Oh yes, they had um, they had a they had a few um, uh, Latinx immigrants show up, like who are also with Cosecha. They had an indigenous person speak up about like Trump's silent war on the indigenous community. So even just like inviting a speaker can like you know make a great difference on a march and who shows up there. Like there is a uh, definitely more of a percentage of people of color there as opposed to the women's march in Kalamazoo. And, uh, oh man, like uh, another advantage of having speeches, one girl who uh, talked specifically about LGBT rights, like, you know, teared up, like, these, th these are real issues that, like, you know, need to be, we be having discussions about this at uh, marches and rallies. And she was talking about how, like, we keep on losing, you know, employment protections, healthcare protections. And this hits, like, especially close to home for me because, you know, I work in an area that does not have um, employment protections, even if... Hillary Clinton was president or something like statewide we don't have Elliot Larson employment or housing protections even if Kalamazoo does so I'm not sure what's going to happen to me if I like you know come out to my job and I, I confide in her with that and I made made a couple very good friends there I might add but um yeah that's uh that's uh, my quick take on uh, the J20 in Grand Rapids it was what it is definitely what it needed to be I wish more people could have come and um, as I guess, like, you know, final take on the Kalamazoo Women's March, there, there was room for improvement, but it was still definitely a net positive. I feel like it was a great outlet for a lot of people. It was very empowering for me personally, and, and I know I'm not the only one. And uh, it did increase turnout by like about a thousand. But now that we're in contact with um, some of the people who helped organize it, well, they are open for, there's, they're open for, uh, constructive criticism and i look forward to coming back next year yeah that, that's great and you know it kind of bouncing off of that and you know feel feel to feel free to respond to this too is um last year when i was when i was in dc i, I went to both as well the j20 and the women's march and the way that i thought about it at the time was you know it's kind of like you know here's the stick here's the carrot it was almost like showing um the government like these are the kinds of resistance that you can face one is pushing for you know uh uh one is pushing in a much different way uh than the other one is a lot more militant and almost reminded me of like you know th th these are kind of the two modes of resistance we've seen in the united states and granted i think um you know, a lot of nonviolent protest kind of goes the next step beyond what the Women's March does. But, um, you know, it's, uh, yeah, to me, it really, like, you know, I, I kind of had a hope, like, you know, this this is kind of confronting the administration and being like, okay, you can either talk to these political organizers in the hats or we've, we're, we're ready to take down <laughs> capitalism with, with, like, bricks and sticks. But, <laughs> you know, um, so I, I don't know if like that that maybe something like that occurred to you as well, but yeah. um, J20 in Grand Rapids was very much uh, was peaceful in the sense that there wasn't even any property damage or physical violence involving you know more than one human directly. There were a couple of like you know masked up um they looked like you know black block and Tifa types, mm -hmm. and I felt a little bit safer with them around just in case like you know people showed up because. Um, with the women's march, there's like you know gonna gonna be a lot more people, of course. First off, and uh, with specifically anti-fascist organizations, then you know who's gonna try to come after us. Like mm -hmm. we, yeah. we got to be wary of that. And um, groups like Antifa, like however you feel about them, like they have a certain place in the movement, and uh, they do they do insist that what they do is self-defense. That's not always the case. It is a whole other discussion. Thankfully, that this. This march was peaceful, and so was the women's marches in uh, both Grand Rapids and Kalamazoo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that yeah, that's very true, and you know, I, I think that, that there definitely needs to be that um, distinction, um, especially when you talk about Antifa. Is you know, it's uh, if if uh, there is um, 
if violence does occur, it is almost always in self-defense, um, or uh, you know, especially since Trump became president, as we saw in places like Charlottesville. Oh yeah, and, right. hey, they saved people's and, lives. Hey, yeah. Antifa, Antifa saved Dr. Cornell West with life. Yeah, right. mm-hmm. so, so that's right. So they they said Antifa saved. A lot of black people's lives at Charlottesville, so I'm so they cool with me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, 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 don't get me like, don't get me wrong. Don't don't get me wrong. I do not support offensive violence. Uh, yeah. this, that's not we we mm-hmm. we are not an advocate for offensive violence. No. Mm-hmm. Civil disobedience, yes. Uh, a protest, yes. Because Martin Luther King said, uh, uh, a riot is the voice. Uh, is the voice for those who are unheard. Mm-hmm. So I understand it's. Uh, it's place in civil society. Well, I think, too, there's a difference between, like, violence as part of an uprising versus... Because, like... No, there, with, yeah, there, there there's there's, been, levels, there's yeah. levels to it. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah. Mm. there's a difference between uh, I'm going to run you over with my car because I don't like you, insert race, gender, whatever, here, mm-hmm. uh, versus... Uh, Occupy Wall Street or Black Lives Matter. I'm marching because of the discriminative, the discriminate, dis- uh, discriminatory, the dis- discriminatory yes. killing <laughs> of minorities. I'm marching because wealth inequality in this country has gotten to the point where the richest three people in the country have just as much wealth as the bottom fifty percent. That is what a new what a new yep. study just came out and said. There's a difference. There are levels to it. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So I I get the fact that I get the fact that we have uh, in in talking about this issue and talking about Antifa and then other in talking about the women's issue. And the point that I'm getting at is I don't want people just to be angry just to be angry. If you're going to be angry, have have some policy something that you stand for you can be angry and just be angry but that's when you start getting manipulated by the establishment either the democrats or republicans oh, yeah. mm-hmm. to fit into an agenda that goes against your best interest well the whole like <laughs> grabbing by the midterms thing like that that can be positive <laughs> yes but you know it's it's like okay Go out and vote, but vote for whom? Is it just Democrats? Because if it's just Democrats, like, oh, uh, who is that guy? I think it's, okay, his name was uh, Doug Jones, and he literally won because black women showed up in in, in massive numbers in Alabama. But then, then he voted for Trump's. Uh, uh, he, he voted to let the Trump administration uh, it, help it be more easier to spy on them. So oh, <laughs> he also just I voted. Say. He also he also just voted uh, voted with Trump on the uh, the the. Basically, Trump has a private army now. That that the, 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 oh the DeVos and the DeVos family and others who mm-hmm. gave Trump millions of dollars. The uh, the other deep state that w- that mm-hmm. we have talked about on the show before. Yeah. It has now gotten worse because now they will have federal funding. They will have taxpayers' money to go and have private militaries who are not overseen by Congress or the Senate. Oh They're God. not overseen by the. Pr- they are only. They are only responsible to. And they only listen to the president. This is how fascism starts, folks. If we already have the brown shirts. The brown shirts wear red hat oh, red hats man. now. Yeah. But now they or, have or an ice badge. Yeah. Really. Or I, or I have ice badge. But now we have the president who has now his own private army that's funded by the American taxpayers. Um. Uh, one thing. I the kind of question and thing I wanted to add was like, I thought that the the president like even before Trump like had. His own private army that he could like you know do covert ops with. Oh no no okay there was there was levels to it. Now Blackwater's okay. like like Blackwater still was overseen by Congress, like okay. bla- like Blackwater oh, and things okay. like that. Like yeah. that's the reason why Abu Ghraib was such it was such a mm. uh, was such a problem, or the reason why Chelsea Manning got arrested mm. and she got locked up is because she was exposing said things. There were there were uh, barriers and boundaries. There were rules that. What private military personnel like Blackwater and things could do. Now they don't have to listen to anybody except the president. Oh yeah, yeah. That's, that's like if you want, if you if for those who do not know what I'm talking about, uh, the Intercept has a really good article on it. The Guardian has a really good article on it. Uh, the Young Turks covered it. Mm-hmm. So did uh, Kyle Kalinske from Secular Talk. I think Jimmy Dore is also going to cover it as well from the Jimmy Dore Show. I know the Young Turks covered it because I just posted it on my Facebook page. <laughs> so if you want to see what I'm talking about, please Google it, look it up, and it's it. God help us all. 
<laughs> See, that's why um, like speaking out like strongly and uh, putting your body on the line to speak out against fascism is so important because like the the presidency and the executive branch as a whole, the deep state, whatever you want to call it, like it has a ridiculous amount of power. Like it's been able to spy on us ever since 2001. It's mm-hmm. been able to, you know, do all these covert ops. It's got like a ridiculously overbloated military that could. Mm-hmm. That could take over the whole world or destroy it all, and like like that. Redacted. Oh, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanna just wanna remind everyone that you effectively haven't had Fourth Amendment rights since the passage of the Patriot Act back in two thousand and one. Right, yep. Have fun with that one. Like right. we can we can mobilize on don't ban our guns, but you can spy on us because we have nothing to hide. As as Rick from Rick and Morty said in his, it's like oh that memory of where I was on nine eleven, and you see like him it was like oh no they're gonna use this they're gonna use this as an excuse to take away our freedoms belt right <laughs> here's the thing here's the thing like is it, this that this that soft bigotry of racism um uh when people say uh if you don't have anything to hide you don't have to worry you don't have to worry about uh you don't have to worry about it forgetting the fact that the nsa and the cia once said that martin luther king was a terrorist like, like, mm-hmm. like so like, like so let's put let's put it in perspective you know that was bobby kennedy that was Bobby Kennedy that 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 let uh, LBJ mm-hmm. spy on a progressive Democratic Socialist. Yeah. <laughs> like, so <laughs> yeah. so I mean like uh, it's, I mean I mean just just to just to put a note on it and just just not just for me too. This not just for me too. This is for everybody who's listening. If you're going to be angry, you have every right to be angry. If you're going to be upset and protest, you have every right to do that. Have purpose behind it. If you're mm-hmm. angry just to be angry, then you are then you can be easily manipulated. That's right. But if you have but if you are angry and you want to do something, then talk about the policies or ideas that would help us, that will help your community and your people. For for me, I can be angry about criminal justice. But I'm angry about criminal justice because of for profit policing, because of broken windows type of uh, mm-hmm. tactics, because of the militarization of the police, because of the over policing of my community and the disproportionate ways that the justice system used to um, destroy and or demo, uh, to to. Uh, to basically destroy my community and I do not and those are the policies and ideas that I talk about that when I'm saying that we need to fix that not just affect my community but affect Americans overall but have policy have ideas just don't be angry just to be angry and you know like th- this might sound a little random but I, I, I do want to recommend a book to anyone who wants to see how how um, the confluence of identity politics and um, like you know uh, political uh, and policy-based activism can come to uh, uh, what synthesize. Uh, I just got done reading "When They Call You a Terrorist" by uh, Patrice Cullors, and mm. she, she's one of the founders of BLM. And I don't think I've ever read a better book. That mixes the personal, the political, and also like a frank discussion of, um, you know, not only black identity, but also LGBTQ uh, identity and the importance of having movements uh, that raise up the voices of the most mar- marginalized. Uh, I, 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 a, a, a quote that I heard from um, one of my favorite political uh one of my favorite activists of all time killer mike once said you cannot our country uh, white progressives will not learn how to progress if you do not take you do not learn from the oppressed if you do not learn from Mm. the oppressed Mm -hmm. and the sense that you we will not find progress in this country if you do not learn from the struggles of those that have been oppressed and what they've had to go through so yeah, That's all right. Um, I'm sorry. Did you want to say something, Nora? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, something qu- quick to yeah. I guess build off that topic. Like people have, I, I guess, talked about this specifically as like you know being uh, intentional and grassroots about your intersectionality, sort of trickle up form of uh, social justice, as opposed to you know what we're used to in both uh, you know a lot of movements and even the economy as a whole. Like if 
like the whole idea of uh, lifting the most marginalized, you eventually do lift all boats, and that's got much more of a proven track record than any trickle down model of a similar nature. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, we talk about like you know, uh, Mister uh, New Deal Grandpa. You know, he didn't. Uh, he's now uh, the most popular politician in America among uh, uh, <laughs> black folks, trans folks. Uh, and that didn't happen Mine, uh, because he talked about having hot man. sauce in, in, in uh, 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 He's also, yeah, he's the most popular politician um, against among Democrats. 80%, over 80% of oh, Democrats yeah. mm-hmm. support the old the old Jewish man from uh, Brooklyn. Yeah. So, and, uh, yeah, just, because, just, yeah, you know, that bucks a lot of narratives. Like, oh, only white people like Bernie Sanders. Actually... Oh, he's the least popular amongst white men. The Bernie bro doesn't exist. The Bernie bro is a myth. The Bernie bro is a complete, the complete, like the Bernie bro is a complete fabrication in order to uh, discredit and disqualify the argument that comes from left progressives of the Democratic establishment. I'm sorry, like it was a complete and utter fabrication. I can sit here and look like one and still say I am not. A, a freaking birdie bro because like it like the the claim is that they're sexist they they they're voting for bernie because they hate they hate women they hate hillary clinton it's just a complete smear job wait, hold on, wait, wait, all right okay just just to just to just yeah. to put an end on this topic because we just went on some really random stuff right now this yeah, is yeah, the, yeah. this is the podcast version of yeah. the hood strategy. Yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> yeah. just just to, just to end on this topic what we're talking about again. yeah exactly that's the point um because we were talking about we were talking when you talk about um if you want to see uh someone who's for policy versus for party ask that person what's something that you disagree with when it comes to the democratic party or when it comes to a specific person in the democratic party hmm. if you can't cut the reason why i say this is because if you ask someone who was a bernie sanders supporter majority of the time they will tell you i like this policy i like this policy i like i like he's for medicare for all he's for universal free college he wants to raise the minimum wage you ask you ask someone who uh, supports Hillary Clinton, you get, well, you don't like her because she's a woman. <laughs> you don't, you don't mm-hmm. like her. You don't like her because oh, yeah. because you know. Insert excuse here. Not because you're talking about policy. Again, it's always about policy. Following the money in policy. That's the number one thing. If you do not learn anything about from politics or learn anything from this show, you always follow the money and you always follow where that where that leads in policy. Yeah, and I, that is important to bring up too, because it's not just us belly aching about what happened in 2016. This, this, these are these are tactics that they continue to use. Like when we've criticized uh, Kamala Harris on the show, and you know, it's like you know, she she like didn't prosecute Steve Mnuchin. Well, is it? Oh, it's because she's a black woman, huh? I mean, over, <laughs> well, over here, like, okay, the I'm, I'm going to touch on something that's kind of explosive here, real quick. But Chelsea Manning, um, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Chelsea Manning is experiencing a lot of similar, like, discreditation uh, to her platform from Democrats specifically because they're trying... They're, they're trying to run the she's a, she's a Russian <laughs> operative uh, smear yeah. job. Mm-hmm. A number of other smear jobs. It, there's stuff coming out about how she was at a Mike Chernovich event or something. Oh yeah, I saw so, that. Yeah, the Chelsea Manning is is a really really uh, volatile figure in in today's discussions. But um, uh, yeah, I saw some of the uh, pictures from that. Like it, it did at least happen to have him. Like her, what her, she was claimed on her Twitter was that she was crashing the party. Like um, she didn't get any selfies. She got like with anybody. She got like one photo with a couple others. And that um, she said I'll, later on on her Twitter that the, one of the best ways to um, to know your enemy is to meet them in their spaces, which is incredibly bold. Like I would not. I, I, first of all, I do not have Chelsea Manning's guts. No, I wish I, I did. I, She's, I, I just want to tap in and say I don't want to meet Mike Chernovich at all. Oh Dude's no, a scumbag. <laughs> like, uh, if I may. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, um, like, and we can't. Uh, I feel like this isn't like necessarily to discredit her because like one of my uh, personal friends like, you know, kind of 
felt like he was gonna, you know, I guess dump Chelsea Manning as a as an icon, so to speak, because of that. But like, if we denounced everybody who could, happened to go to a party with like white supremacists in it, then we'd be denouncing half the progressive movement every Thanksgiving and Christmas. <laughs> like, no, no, no. Here's here's the thing. It's not just it's not just with Chelsea Manning. Look at what they were saying about uh uh Joe jo, jo Stein. Joe Stein because she was at a table. Oh, with oh. with with Vladimir yeah. Putin, that she that her and the Green Party and everybody that was that was around it uh, yeah. were are uh, are a bunch of Russian bots. Black Lives Matter. Some people from Black Lives Matter uh, <laughs> uh, did uh, use. Wait, they they oh, they man. shared some posts on Facebook that came from Russian bots, forgetting the fact that Hillary Clinton spent over a million dollars during the primary and during the general with bots for her. So like okay. like I'm just yeah. like 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 the, the, the thing about oh. the tactics that like in that in that book that you're talking about when they call you a terrorist the whole idea of black identity extremists or the whole idea of um of that Bernie supporters or progressives were pie in the sky fairy dusters because we want universal health care like every other industrial nation and the reason why I bring that up because yesterday Bernie Sanders did a town hall for two hours and it was streamed on youtube it was on now this the young turks and uh and another i forgot what the other uh it might have even been on live tv on no, some channels so, no no but it's it, no uh, but it, it's about six ten. Oh, but let's oh, oh. uh so i think we'll take a quick break kind of take I, yeah. uh, assemble our docket of what we're going to talk <laughs> about the, rest of the hour and i think well, healthcare. if you we want to hit on that next yeah, yeah that'd be a good idea um all right, you're listening to the Hood Rat Strategist radio program, only on 89.1 WIDR Kalamazoo, your only source for political revolution. States, which is a band playing for you, our instruments backwards. Now we're going to speak with you briefly backwards for a moment while we play our instruments for you forwards. You're listening to WIDR Radio Forwards. Wider FM is supported in part by local Kalamazoo and greater West Michigan businesses like yours. If you are interested in getting your businesses... Wider is proud to be supported by Pedal Bicycle. Pedal Bicycle has two locations on 611 West Michigan Ave and 185 Romans Road. More information can be found at pedalbicycle.com. Weekly RSO Spotlight. Hi, I'm Alex Police. And I'm Kelly Coffee Tabby. We are proud members of Sigma Kappa Sorority. We live our day to day values of loyalty, personal growth, friendship, and service. We are the main benefactor for the Alzheimer's Association. If you would like to learn more about Sigma Kappa's involvement in Greek life, visit our website at wmish.simicappa.org or follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Sigma Kappa WMU. For information on this week's RSO, you can visit westernherald.com, YBOT, WMU on YouTube, or WiderFM.org.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back. This is the Hood Rat Strategist radio program only on 89.1 WIDR Kalamazoo. Uh, so let's go ahead and talk about, uh, you know, so we mentioned earlier, Michigan's been in the news for all the wrong reasons. Part of some of those reasons, um, we've had a couple of people deported, uh, one of whom is a doctor from right here in the Kalamazoo area. Um, there was a, a Mexican uh, family man who has been in the country for 30 years. Who just got deported out of Detroit. We'll talk about them more specifically in a minute, but I wanted to... That's that's kind of the backdrop to uh, Democrats caving with the government shutdown. And uh, let's... I want to walk through it and explain to... Like, really explain to people, because I actually had somebody hop on my news feed. I, I posted that... Um, uh, oh, 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 man. I'm Sean King uh, quote. Oh, yeah. And... Uh, he, he responded, you know, um, and, you know, it's well-meaning, but like, well, you know, the shutdown affects a lot more lives and the 800,000 and, you know, we just, they needed to, they needed to, uh, uh, you know, make sure that people got taken care of. So and, Schumer's spine is made out of wet spaghetti. Yeah. yeah, on, yeah. It's amazing how uh, our government can shut down, but Haiti and other and the other asshole countries, <laughs> how they how they were able to keep the government working <laughs> in, yeah. in all those countries. Yeah, that, and yeah, that's amazing. That that's really amazing. It's amazing how the country, <laughs> overwhelming majority of the country, over twenty percent, mm-hmm. over uh, it was I think sixty percent of the country agreed that the shutdown was because of. The Republicans, and you know that's the crazy oh, yeah. thing about it, because like public opinion was on the Democrat side when the when the Republicans pulled this crap back in was it 2013, something 20, like that. Yeah, yeah, public opinion did not like what they were doing. They mm. didn't, but the Democrats they had the public on their side. They had them on their side. Well, and, to, just for yeah. people to have context, Chip, which, which the Republicans took hostage, has 85 percent approval rating uh, by the American people. That's that Democrats, Republicans, Independents. DACA had over 82 percent of Americans, Democrats, Republicans, Independents. They took that hostage. The American people wanted those things to be passed. And the Democrats not only caved in, the Democrats also offered to pay for the wall. That Mexico was supposed oh, to be paying for. Oh yeah, uh, um, like like if I may, what? <laughs> not to mention, not to mention, a, yet another tax cut snuck oh, in. Oh seriously? Yeah. Yep. Like, After the, okay, the that whole, for. the whole reason the shutdown happened in the first place is because we wanted a clean DACA bill. And that means not putting in these far right, super draconian border security measures like the stupid wall. And Democrats were like, Oh, oh, oh I'll give you your stupid wall. Why not? Hold on, no, no, oh, oh, also. When uh, Trump Trump put out a tweet about this, and they were saying that he wanted to, uh, that when he wanted the wall, he wanted the wall to be uh, see through. He wanted a fence. He wanted to put a fence around the border. Yeah. You also why want does this to sound familiar. You, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. And for those who do not understand why that's significant, you also want to know who also wanted to put a fence on the southern border. Hillary Clinton. Yeah. There's actually a clip where like there's there's an immigrant right activist. Uh, and this is during the 2016 election, asking Hillary, it's like, well, how is that different than the wall? <laughs> it, 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 it was um, in, uh, in, the, in the town hall, the town hall yeah. that they had mm-hmm. with Hillary Clinton. Um, is that the one with Bernie in it, too? Yeah, that was the one yeah. with Bernie in it, too. It was, uh, 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 I forgot the Latin, the Latin uh, uh, commentator who was, a part of, who was a part of Univision. I forgot his name. Uh, he asked her, how is, how is your fence along the border wall any different from Trump's wall? Like, it, yeah. it, the thing... The thing that pissed me off the absolute most about the about this is that the Democrats were fighting from a position of power. If I was them, and if I was in that administration, I wouldn't have just been fighting for Chip and DACA. I would have said, "We're also not going to cut um, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. We're also going to put. Uh, we're also going to defend net neutrality." Oh, yeah. All of yeah. all of mm-hmm. those issues that I just named have seventy-five to ninety percent approval rating by the American people. You're fighting from a position of strength with the people, with the American people backing you, yet you choose to cave. Nora, yeah. <laughs> so, um, like these, as you mentioned, these are like incredibly popular policies, and all these before Trump took office were the status quo as we knew it. Yeah. Like the fact. 
that we have to beg the Democrats, the Democrats, to give us like these, even these status quo solutions that like, you know, corporate America was still cool enough with to leave in for four to eight years. Like, they, they, they couldn't stick up for that. Like, however, um, you know, the, the timing of, uh, you know, these shutdowns and deadlines are kind of interesting because the Democrats already didn't uh, shut down the government over the Christmas break. And I wonder if they did that on purpose to, like, make the shutdown happen on Trump's anniversary and or to, I'll, I'll get to you, and or to um, not have the government shut down over Christmas when they, you know, probably prefer to have a Christmas break. Even even so, like, it's still DACA market. recipients are losing their status and at risk of deportation right now. Like, this isn't something that we can wait for, like, necessarily. This is, this is real. This is right now. And it's... It's gotten so bad that like people have to beg the Democrats for the status quo. No, no, no. Here's the, thing, here's the thing. Here's the thing. And let's and let's not forget. Let's not forget. And people are going to hate me for this, especially a lot of my uh, uh, my uh, black friends and family, because I'm about to say something that they don't want to hear. The Democratic Party under a Democratic president broke the record on deportations. Mm, this is did. fact. Uh, this Kosecha is fact. will call call they uh, Kosecha, other immigrants' right groups. They call Obama the deportable chief. chief. So. Yeah. So the fact that you have a president who openly is saying we're going to deport you and but it's worse. Again, context matters. Context matters. Some of those people, majority of those people that were being deported were criminals. They're not deporting criminals now. No. They are they are deporting they're deporting business owners. They're deporting children from schools. ICE is going to uh, there was a story about a kid in Chicago who a 12-year-old that was going to school and ICE rolled up at their school. To, to because he was an illegal immigrant. These these are the things that have gotten worse under our president. And uh, you know, I wanted to mention this has been a big local story. Uh, just recently, ICE. Uh, I'll use the term kidnapped. This is what I this is what I say. ICE kidnaps people. They kidnapped <laughs> uh, Doctor Lucas Meek, who works at Bronson Hospital. Who it, it, it and he's been in the country for forty years. He left Poland when he was five years old. I actually, I think I've lit- I have literally spent more time in Poland than this guy. Um, and they picked him up for like two very minor offenses yeah. that happened when he was a teenager. Two misdemeanors. The guy is the guy has his permanent residency. Like he he's he's got a permanent green card, and ICE is using these two. Minor, minor misdemeanors, uh, destruction of property of less than a hundred dollars, and uh, possession of stolen property. Mm-hmm. Uh, those are the, those are the two things. Like back when he was a teenager, literally over twenty years ago, uh, that he did as grounds to deport him. Now, I I, I want to let everybody know that. Like while Obama is known as the deporter in chief, and the context of that is he, like the Obama administration was very aggressive against uh, the criminal element within uh, un- the undocumented community. We also have to understand that the majority of the undocumented community are 100% law-abiding. The reason mm-hmm. why yeah. the reason why sanctuary cities exist is so that the undocumented community will come forward to law enforcement and help them stop crime. That is why sanctuary cities exist. It's not so it's not some liberals going against the federal government is literally to help drive crime numbers down. How about uh, states rights? Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> yeah there you no, no, go. I'm I'm not done. <laughs> um Instead of, like, with that context in mind, instead of going after the criminal element, now Trump opened up the floodgates to any kind of, uh, any kind of violation is grounds for deportation, no matter what. This is, like, honestly, this is precursor rounding people up and putting them in camps. Yeah. Exactly. I'm, I'm, like... I'm sorry, you can't, like, if you look at this, if you know anything about the history of World War II, if you know anything about the history of Germany in World War, uh, of World War II, if you know anything about the history of the National Socialist Party in Germany, up to their, uh, Taken their their hold of power within Germany, you know that this is part of what they did. Like, the whole, like, sectioning off 
of groups and going, well, you're not supposed to be here, so leave. You're not supposed to be here, so leave. Oh, well, there are just too many people for us to hunt down individually, so if you're part of this demographic, we're going to round you up and put you in a ghetto. Okay, so I'm going to bounce to Nora and Lawrence, but real quick, just some context. For those of you, maybe you know about the doctor from Bronson who got kidnapped by ICE, but I want to give it a little bit more context. Uh, In the week of January 18th, uh, three different high-profile immigration activists, one right outside, one right out of Detroit. Um, that was uh, Jorge Garcia, um, uh, Ravi uh, Ragbeer from New York, and uh, Amir Osman uh, from Ohio, were all arrested and faced deportation. Uh, um, uh, Jorge has already been de- deported. I-, I can't remember the the status of uh, Ravi or Amir, but. That's what's different with 2018. They are deliberately targeting activists and people you wouldn't expect would get arrested. ICE has changed tactics. They are trying to scare the F out of the activist community. And as they said at the Kosecha meeting I was at last Saturday, you know it's getting bad when they start arresting white people. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, A couple quick things I wanted to point out. Um... With the National Socialist Party in Germany, they didn't start by saying, oh, let's kill them all. Let's, they started with saying, oh, these, these damn immigrants in our country, let's deport them. Mm, that, yeah. that was what the discussion was, first off. Uh, another, another fun fact that relates to an earlier point, like, I, I, don't, I don't remember what the source of this is, but apparently Obama deported more people in 2016 than Trump did in 2017. Uh, that, oh, yeah. it makes that, me that, wonder: Are they running out of people? The no, no. What's the, going on? No, the thing is, the thing is, is it's it's twofold. One, we've gotten to the point where, yes, like I said, the brown shirts up here, a lot of them wear red hats, and a lot of them are wearing ice badges. The other thing is that when you talk about immigrants in our in this in our society, they are four to five times more likely to not commit crimes. The reason why is because they're afraid of being deported. Exactly. A lot of these people are also business owners and also college graduates. These same people. That uh, that the right wing uh, demagogue and they want to destroy as the other. They're the reason why you're losing jobs. They're the reasons why uh, the housing market is down, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They're the reason why your food tastes funny. You know, these communities p- put about a third of our GDP, a third of our national GDP, are is off the backs of immigrants. And, so so yeah. so when it comes down to the, when it comes down to the national figures and it comes down to the overall well-being of our country from the food that you pick from the clothes from the clothes that you're wearing it is touched by the hands of immigrants illegal or illegal or illegal or illegal so the thing that what makes it scary about not just ICE and whatever, and the reason why we're so disappointed in the Democrats and to begin with is because these are the same people who are supposed to be fighting for this disenfranchised group. It's the Democrats that are supposed to be fighting and supposed to have their back. The Democrats failed them and failed us. When you fail the the immigrants who, uh, that... Uh, that are the backbone of our society. You are failing Americans. And there's no other way to put it. And the Democrats, because of their cowardness, and it's not cowardice, it's because of their financial interests and their donors are the reasons why, like you said, the um, the whole idea about the shutdown is because they don't want the markets to move. Remember, the donors from oh, the, yeah. the, mon- mm-hmm. the donors of the Democratic Party are the same donors that are given money to the Trump administration. Trump's donors are the same ones that Chuck Schumer and Debbie Washington Schultz and Cory Booker and the rest of them, they are all getting paid by the same people. That's the reason why we don't have what we have. Jump uh, Nora and then Luke. One thing that, like, I guess, even from, like, the donor's perspective that doesn't, like, quite add up to me, since, like, you know, immigrants, you know, make up, you know, immigration as as a whole makes up, like, such a crazy amount of our GDP... Like, you don't want the whole economy to crash if you got a ton of money, but, like, you know, we've seen it before with 08, they can just get away with it and have someone bail them out. That's, yeah, you know, that's, um, the I, they, that's the reason why, because they know we'll bail them out. You know, I think, like, you know, part of that, too, is, like, you got to remember, like, the man or the establishment or whatever you want to call it. it. It's not a hegemon. So, like, I mean, you saw this in net neutrality. You had. You know, people like Jeff Bezos, who's the richest man in the world, companies like Google, who wanted to maintain it. Oh, yeah. ISPs didn't. And that was an internal fight amongst our oligarchs and, you know, the ISPs won. I think it's kind of a similar thing with immigration because you have a lot 
who like they they want it easier. They don't want immigrants to be scared. They they de- want depend on that workforce to get more profits. But there are also components of uh, you know the oligarchy who uh, one yeah like you said don't want the the markets to move with the whole shutdown stuff. But also and I, and I did want to bring this up. You know it's a de- it's a bit of a deceptive statistic when we're talking about how. Well, yes, there were uh, more de- deportations under Obama um, in 2015 than in the first year of Trump's administration. Or, 2016, I mean, I'm 2016, not sure about 2015. 2016, I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, But there were more arrests. And what you see is there's been a lot of investment over the last year during Trump's administration in, in camps and in prisons and in Private leasing thing. out, yeah, leasing out prison space for detained immigrants. So, you know, it's something I've been thinking about an awful lot is that I think a lot of it is um, it's going to be less about deporting them and more about finding a new cheap, free prison labor source. But I mean, I mean to to kind of roll back also on kind of the point to keep, keep immigrants scared, uh, the agriculture industry is like I, I've just been kind of absorbing little bits of information as I surf the internet I'm not an expert on anything I just read a lot um, the agriculture industry is in America is overwhelmingly staffed by immigrant labor whether they be legal or uh, illegal immigrants that is you, you don't see, we haven't really heard much about ICE busting up onto a farm to round up all of the undocumented workers that are there because now the agriculture, now it's like three quarters of your workforce has just been sent back to Mexico. What do you do? There, there was an incident in New Era, Michigan um, over the fall where they did snatch up about 11 folks. Uh, uh, but, the, yeah. the reason, but again, the reason why you have people hiding in churches now and you have people hiding in, um, hiding in uh, people's basements because of ICE and because of the immigration policy, it's two things. One, it is the uh, the oligarchs who are pushing who are pushing the policy. It's two, it's because of Trump's rhetoric. His racism has become policy, and you see that you see that in how in how America's been treating Haiti. It's that, that goes that goes well. That's well before Trump said what he said about Haiti. But afterwards, um, you see how how they are treating immigrants ever since he's been. Um, or just people who look different in our country ever since he's been on the national scene. This is not a, uh, this, as a black man in America, this is nothing new. <laughs> like, the, I, like, I've seen, we, we've seen this story play out before. <laughs> so if you know anything about American history. But the, but the thing that bothers me the most is that. It goes back to it goes back to what I was saying before. The thing that bothers me the most is the people who are supposed to be representing that group, that group that does not have political power, that group that does not have financial power. Those representatives let them down. They caved. And I do want that's the thing that and that's the thing that that bothers me the most. It's because if I understand that. Activism pushes policy more than anything else. Mm -hmm. I get that. I also understand that you're going to have, you're going to have, you're going to end up fighting against the police force, you know, immigration force. We're going to have to do that in in America. We're going to have to do it in a productive manner. I get that. The thing that, the thing that I'm afraid of is those white moderates, these democratic central neoliberals, who keep caving and will not fight. Yeah. That's what bothers me the most. Cuz if because if they're the only thing that we're supposed to that we're supposed to have faith in the resistance the resistance just buckled. I mean, this is like the first actual resistance that the Democratic Congress has done <laughs> since Trump yeah, got elected. And I, I did want to mention though, actually something a little bit in their defense and something I was thinking about when when my friend posted 
about how like you know this government shutdown affects a lot more people than than the dreamers and we have to we have to uh, it's it's more moral to negotiate it when like their livelihoods whatever aren't at risk um the democrats to their credit we're pushing the entire time for like well let you know the government's going to shut down but let's put through this thing to make sure that the military families are still paid that our workers are still paid and the republicans who had spent like hours on the floor de- you know denouncing the democrats were like putting the american people and our veterans at risk didn't allow that to come to the floor. Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh, no, yeah. Um, if what I may. Uh, so, like, we saw we saw it on Mitch McConnell's Twitter. Like, he's like, oh, do you, are you going to stand up for, like, the how, how many people on chip exactly? Like, apparently there's more people that are on chip that are on DACA. And he was, like, you know, he was holding chip hostage to, like, get Democrats to cave on DACA. And They've been holding chip hostage since September. Since they're, that's true. So they're, yeah. <laughs> that point is complete garbage already. Yeah. No, no, no. The, the, other, the other thing about that is that it was Claire McCaskill, who I do not like. Uh, I do right. not like yeah, her. Yeah, yeah. It was Claire McCaskill who went on the floor and said, let's do a clean bill for the troops. And it was Mitch McConnell who said, I object to that. <laughs> Thanks and for clarifying. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't remember uh, yeah. so, uh, the so, so, so when, again, elections matter. Elections, elections, elections matter. Here's the thing, folks. It's also who you put in power. Because... The demo. Let's not forget, and I'm not gonna let anybody forget. The Democrats are fighting for, for from a position of strength that had the backing of the American people. They could have asked for more, and they did not do it. Not only did they didn't, they did not do it. They actually gave the Republicans the things that they wanted in their bill. So what mm-hmm. we what we see in this political climate is that the Republicans are the Harlem Globetrotters and the Democrats are the Washington Generals. Mm-hmm. If you ever seen the Harlem Globetrotters game, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. The Democrats are being paid to be a fake opposition, and they're being paid to lose. Nora. See, yeah. this is, uh, the, the shutdown's still, like, you know, going back to, I guess, an earlier point, so, so shutdown's still, like, 100% the Republicans' fault, it because, is. like, we wouldn't be having this conversation if Trump didn't haphazardly cancel DACA in the first place, yeah. which mm-hmm. he probably doesn't even necessarily, um, disagree with ideologically, because he doesn't believe in anything. He's just going along with that, whatever his crazy racist base are does. You, oh, well, you, you know, the fire in... Trump doesn't even know what DACA yeah, means. Of course yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. That's spell, my point. Yeah. They they're like, Trump can't spell <laughs> DACA. Like, what you, what you mean? <laughs> D-A-K-A. Right. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, no, D-A-K-K-K-A. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I have the best DACA's, tremendous right. DACA's, believe me. Believe me. Well, you know, the thing is, like, you know, he's such a malleable figure. And, I mean, this is a little bit of a detour, and I'm only going to briefly mention it. But, you know, it kind of got confirmed in the, in the there's a quote in the Fire and Fury book where it's basically Trump's opinion is based a lot on whoever last left the room. So you notice, he's like. George Bush a lot in a way. Yeah. And in many ways, he's he's George Bush because George Bush was the same thing. That's why Dick Cheney yeah. was always the last one in the room. He's like, yeah. Um, uh, well, it, it was uh, Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi met with, him, met with him about DACA, and he was tweeting Democratic talking points about it. And then the next day, <laughs> like, I guess, like, either. I don't know who it was, if Steve Bannon was still there or whatever, but he pulled him aside. He's like, no, you're supposed to be racist. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, n- never mind. Yeah, screw the dreamers. <laughs> but, uh, okay, let's, all right, let me, but the, but the other thing that I wanted to get at uh, before before I, before I um, we get too far off topic, um, it was also talking about health care. The one of the, the the thing that the two things that the Democrats were fighting for was was Chip, and was fighting for uh, DACA, and they did not ask for anything more beyond that. They didn't. They did not ask for net neutrality. They didn't say that we're going to fight for Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. They didn't. They didn't say we're going to cut back on some of the money that we gave the military, and we're going to put that to our roads and bridges. Because they voted for that military oh, budget increase. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah. It was in <laughs> in um ah uh, it was Doug Jones that voted for that. Like what are you like Doug? Oh my god! I was you so know, angry. Part of me is glad that the uh, budget that includes the wall didn't. I'm glad that didn't pass. Like, because, oh my God. We, no, please, they no were wall. trying. They were trying. Okay, here's, here's the thing. I'm going to make some people upset. Look, wall or no wall, people are still going to get through. The majority, the ma- overwhelming majority of immigrants that come to this country come on a plane. Okay? 
over 40 to 50 percent of immigrants that come to this country come come on a uh, come well, on uh, who in, who an was airplane. it in Trump's cabinet who was it uh, uh, Kelly well one of them talked about uh, in private to the his, his Hispanic caucus that it's like well Trump didn't really know what he was talking about I mean, I mean uh, there was that there's that parody video that makes it makes its rounds every so often about uh, telling Trump supporters about uh, Ladders. About, about ladders. <laughs> yes. what, what is, what is, what, is what, this? What's, what's this light? They make these in Mexico? <laughs> this, uh, they're right yeah, here. Yeah, they're right here. Yeah, yeah, no, to, and not only that, like most uh, quote unquote illegal immigrants or undocumented immigrants are actually people who flew here, had a legal visa, overstayed their visa, ne- and never got it, never got it renewed for whatever reason. Um, all right, um, I think we need to cut to a break real quick, and then we come back. Um, try to jump on to another topic. Uh, it's about 6.40 right now. So thank you all. Um, you're listening to the Hood Rat Strategist radio program, only on 89.1 WIDR Kalamazoo, your only source for political revolution. Hunger's rather prominent issue amongst the student body of Western. The Invisible Need Project is a multifaceted initiative that's aimed to help struggling students. Every two weeks, generous people donate their food to the pantry located in the Fonts Student Service buildings or other drop-off locations. All you need to do is grab a reusable bag and grab whatever food you need to help sustain yourself. If anyone's unsure when their next meal will be, or if you have a little extra food you'd be willing to donate, the food pantry is your place. If you're looking to help donate, become a volunteer, or just learn more, call 269-387-4742 or email dosa-imp at wmich.edu for details. Wider FM is supported in part by local Kalamazoo and greater West Michigan businesses like yours. If you are interested in getting your business's name on the air while supporting Radio Evolution, please visit WiderFM.org for underwriting packages and other support options. This is the Hood Rat Strategist Radio Program, only on 89.1 WIDR Kalamazoo. So, uh, I, I guess there's a couple things to talk about. Like, um, I, I know, uh, Lawrence, you were anxious to talk about uh, New Deal Grandpa had a uh, <laughs> healthcare um, town hall last night. Uh, and I, I actually haven't gotten a chance to watch it myself, um, but I know we've touched on a lot of the other really important things um, that we're going to talk about. Um Let's see. Um, it was like an hour and forty-five minutes long, dog. Like, yeah, it yeah. Was an hour. It was an hour and forty-two minutes long. Uh, it was a town. It was a town hall that had actual nurses and doctors from other countries to talk about single-payer healthcare. It also had business owners and talking about how healthcare affects their business. Um, I forgot who said it, but uh, uh, 
I forgot who said it. It was a business owner that said healthcare is the tapeworm in our American economy. And the reason why is because if I, as an employer, uh, what it what it does is it makes employers become unethical. How does how, why would you say that? Walmart doesn't give healthcare to a majority of its workers. Walmart is the biggest employer in America, so. They encourage their employer employees to get on welfare and to get Medicaid and to get other government finance programs. Those programs are paid for by taxpayers' money. So we are financing Walmart's employees, and Walmart should be doing that as a corporation. So. If I'm a mom and pop store that's in the same city as Walmart and I offer health care, but I'm taking more money out of your paycheck to offer you health care, it, 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 I cannot compete. As a business owner, I'm not going to be able to compete. You're just going to go work for Walmart. So the thing is, is that as of right now, we pay twice as much as every other industrial major country. We do not have to pay more. We could pay just as much money as every other country and go to a single payer system right now and we could cover everybody or the quality of care would be better and it would be affordable for the American people. As a, uh, In the town hall, one of the figures that they brought up is that Americans pay anywhere between $10,000 to $12,000 for each, for each person in America. In Canada, are are oh, for man. for in can in care in Canada, the government pays four thousand dollars around around four thousand dollars to cover each other uh, each citizen in Canada. They pay twice as less as we do. They cover oh, everyone man. in their life expectancy. In a recent polling, their life expectancy is three years longer than ours. So they're healthier than we are. They cover everybody, and everyone has a, have uh, they cover everybody. They're healthy, healthier than we are, and no one's ever denied or had to go into medical bankruptcy because of their care. Now, the thing that for those who wants to see it, it's on YouTube. It's on. It's on. It's under TYT. It's also on now. This so you can watch the town hall. Mm-hmm. It's an hour and forty two minutes. It is worth watching my god is it worth watching it is eye opening they go through they they get uh they get questions from uh republicans they get questions from independents about single payer health care they get questions from americans who have uh, that that do not understand it but they go in depth talking about medicare for all and it it and blew I'm my to mind. Remember, was this? Uh, this was just like on the internet. It wasn't hosted by any major news network. Oh no, no, it wasn't. That. It wasn't hosted by any major news networks. Mostly because uh, it's kind of hard to talk about Medicare for all when the biggest lobbyist industry in our uh, political sphere is the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah, and, and this is kind of <laughs> tangential, but this is something I kind of forgot to bring up when we're talking about immigration is so the the um, the the Polish. Well, he's not even really Polish, but the the doctor who was born in Poland who got deported, um, that that is a story, um, and he's from here in Kalamazoo. That's a story that actually made it to like the Washington Post, CNN, um, the uh, the immigration rights activists that I mentioned. Uh, those all of those headlines were from Democracy Now, and not any mainstream outlet. So, um, you know, it 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 definitely matters. Like. Um, you know, we talk a lot about on the show, like what the corporate media will and will not cover, and it's always like, uh, well, you know, it, well, there's a. Well, think about the last time they've had Bernie Sanders on CNN or MSNBC. The last time they had had them on CNN and MSNBC, he was having a debate with, Tom, uh, I think, uh, t- uh, 
Uh, he had a he had a de- uh, he had a debate with Ted Cruz. Cruz. Yeah. He also had a thing with uh, with um, Cassidy and uh, uh, Lindsey Graham. And he also had a thing with uh, what's his name? Uh, the dude from Ohio. Um, oh, John Kasich. He also had a yeah. thing with John Kasich. So they showed so they show this neutrality bias when it comes to everything. Republicans say this. Democrats say this. Who all knows? Ooh. They had a this uh, town hall was a sit down town hall with nurses, doctors, business uh, business owners who have to give health care to their employees. This was a town hall to discuss how how if we just drop the number on Medicare from. 65 to 0 we would save money now we don't have to do anything different it's just if everybody could get into medicare then we could save money now that's right and yeah. they spent they spent half of the town hall talking about how to pay for it like it was it was amazing to me to see how and it, it was funny to me cuz i'm like oh i can see why cnn and msnbc wouldn't cover this because they would have to go to a commercial break and the commercial break would be financed by Bear or be financed by Monsanto's <laughs> yeah, or be yeah. financed by <laughs> Spicer or something. Like they don't want they don't yeah, want that. Yeah, yeah. But no <laughs> it, It'd be a lot of interruptions like, well what we have to do is is tax all the big drug corporations. Oh we'll be back, Senator Sanders. Let's go to a break. <laughs> yeah. I just yes. wanted to comment like the uh whole CNN has Bernie Sanders debating Ted Cruz about health care. That's not a debate. That is not a debate. It is, that's not a debate. That's Ted Cruz over on the right wing talking like a crazy person about how the free market will handle everything when the free market is has demonstrated that it doesn't want to, can or want to control uh, health care prices. Uh him going on CNN to debate Lindsey Graham and about, well, I think it was healthcare again. It was like the second round of healthcare. Again, not a debate. Bernie Sanders is over here with the facts, with the numbers to, to back it up, with the argument for it, and there's uh, the Republicans dancing around issues about, well, hey, uh, if we actually ask you pointed questions about what goes like what goes on with your plan you seem to dodge them when we ask bernie sanders about his plan he seems to have answers <laughs> i wonder why yeah seeing it like whenever i'm uh, i'm i'm kind of with kyle kalinsky of secular talk on this is that the modern american debate is part of the bread and circuses of keeping the american people complacent because really when you these these performative debates where nothing substantial gets covered and the moderators allow the people uh, talking to dance around questions or outright lie in order to avoid giving the answer that will lose them support um, that's not debate that's that's not debate uh, on top of the fact that, like, overall, debate is really performative because it doesn't allow you to actually get into the nitty-gritty of the details of a position uh, when you have to toss it back to the other side where they get to uh, try and poke holes in your argument even if there are no holes in your argument. Uh, it's, it's just... It's the lowest form of discourse uh, when... And, and I see it all the time, especially on the internet. It's just a back and forth wrote, oh, you said that talking point. Here's my copy paste of this talking point, which I know you'll respond with this talking point. So let me just get ahead of you like three paragraphs because I already know <laughs> yeah. where this conversation is going. Yeah. I already know everything you are going to say. All right. L- Lawrence has been chopping at the bit oh. to, to oh, no, comment. No. When so. we talk about and we talk about when we talk about uh, Republicans. At, during the town hall, you'll probably see this. There's a doc, There's a doctor from uh, Slovenia. There's a doctor from uh, Canada, and there's a nurse that's from uh, that's from uh, I forgot what I forgot the other country that she's from. Bernie Sanders asked them, "Have you? What would happen if uh, the right in your country would suggest taking away health care from your citizens?" They almost literally laughed out loud. You know how you put. You know how we put LOL. No, they 
<laughs> literally were like, are you crazy? <laughs> Th- those people, that person would get voted out of the country. <laughs> they would be, they, their citizen card would yeah. be revoked. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, can I, you I, imagine if, if, if the right wing in other countries are, are saying, we're not crazy enough to take away health care from people. But the right wing in this country says, hey, not only do you, do you not deserve health care, don't get sick. And our health care plan is, if you get sick, die quickly. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a much bigger discussion, though, I think, about kind of the way that the American public is almost been, like, kind of couched and sedated by, uh, you know, like the, the neoliberal project. I mean, you go all the way back to uh, the Powell memo, and it, it lays this out pretty clearly uh, how, like, we need to make sure that people are less educated. We need to make sure that people do not organize in the same way that they were oh, during the I 60s and 70s. Um, and, you know, uh, th- there was this article from Henry Rollins, and it's kind of a pithy remark, but there's a lot of truth to it. And says, like, the real American social safety net is 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 booze cheap food and tv and it's almost as long as you as americans have those three things bread and circus bread and circus right um they're not gonna wake up and realize wait we've we have all all of these things that all these major western capitalist countries have we ain't got it and i mean people are starting to wake up to that now but yeah it's it's really amazing to think how like things that people in other countries would just tear down the establishment for we're just like okay that's cool yeah no, 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 no the fact that the fact that uh, within the next 10 years we're going to spend 20 20 trillion dollars on health care if we went to a single payer system if we went to medicare for all dropping the zero dropping the number from 65 dropping the dropping it from 65 to uh zero we would spend 11 trillion dollars over 10 years we would save nine trillion dollars let's do you know what we can do with nine trillion dollars? <laughs> oh man! Well, like, if like, you're if you're if the current establishment, <laughs> buy a lot you, of bombs. Do you mean like <laughs> end poverty <laughs> and hunger in America with nine trillion dollars? Because you can do it with less than that and still have money left over for other things. It, the, the United could, Nations, the United Nations said, United Nations said that we could that we can end world hunger or world poverty with just no no with just the with just the money that we gave our military. The hundred, the hundred billion. Wasn't which, it like eighty billion? No, no, we get no, it was 80 billion. no. Yeah. But just with that, we could end poverty. Like, like, yeah. like, yeah. like, like yeah. the United Nations said that. So it's like, would with, with the money that we give to our military, we could end, we could end world poverty like four or five times over. We could, we but, but clearly, Lawrence, like the, all the homeless population in this country, just needs to grab themselves by their bootstraps. Oh my god! <laughs> uh, all right, I'm sorry, Nora. You're <laughs> oh, I forgot. Oh, I, think I almost forgot the point I was making earlier, but um, you have, have to come back to me. Okay. Right. Um, we'll talk about it later. But yeah, yeah, uh, yeah it's kind of. I mean, that, uh, you know, that was that was more or less a joke. But I mean, that's that's another great part of American culture, and that's why you'll like. It's it's really insane. I, I've I, you you will get an argument from Americans that uh, health care is not a right; it, it should be earned. And like, why? Why is it that something that needs to be earned? It seems pretty basic to me. Shouldn't we like strive to is, have a better is, society that, that takes care of its people? You know. Wait, hold on. Wait. So th- we're we're still on health care, right? Yeah. Here, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so health care things things that are necessary to live sometimes it's medicine medicine is a part of health care you have a right to life uh, tell me about how uh, you don't have a right to health care again um, if you have a right to life then why like but you don't have a right to health care so I guess you have the right to to really crappy life, yeah. so if you hate it, just end it. <laughs> well, like, I mean, no, no, you have no. What you'll hear from what you'll hear from the right is, well, you need to work for that. You know, we we we're tired of moochers. We're tired. We're tired of people. Uh, eking, uh, uh, sucking the life out of the system. Forget the fact that we just gave a trillion dollar tax break to multinational corporations that 
they don't need. Oh, yeah. And because like, they right, are the most profitable corporations in the world. Yeah, right here, like in Kalamazoo, mm-hmm. like, you what? know, who, who profits? You know, Stryker and, 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 and Upjohn and like the Pfizer. You know, it's <laughs> like, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we don't need moochers of the system for, don't, now don't say anything as we give these tax breaks to millionaires and billionaires where, Again, a, a recent study just came out, and I cannot stress this enough. The richest three people in our country owns more wealth than half of our country. The richest 42% of people on the planet own more wealth than half of the planet. And and if you're the richest man, Jeff Bezos, how do you make that profit? Well, you, you put an ambulance outside of your warehouse <laughs> when, <you're, laughs> when your employees pass out from exhaustion. Send them in there, and they can pay a, a, a copay because they don't. Have I mean, they're they're they moving could, uh, they're <laughs> moving they're moving factories from uh, they're moving factories from China that are suicide factories that have suicide nets to America. Oh well, yeah, that that was a thing in uh, Wisconsin actually. Yeah, they moved they're, a Foxconn they're, factory. they're moving a Foxconn factory yeah. to Wisconsin. Now, for those who not understand what Foxconn what Foxconn does, they work their hour, they work their uh, their employees sixteen to eighteen hour days. A lot of their employees sometimes end up sleeping at the factory. They work so hard that some of them tr- commit suicide. So what Foxconn they did, did said, hey, let's roll back on some of these hours. No, we need to push these products. Let's get some nets. So we can catch these. So we can catch the uh, people who's jumping off the buildings. Nora, yeah, see when the the Foxconn, uh, <laughs> I think it was a plant specifically. When they came to Wisconsin, like it was a uh, Governor Walker made a big deal about it. Like, oh, it's going to create tons of jobs. Like, mm. dude, like your your whole thing was like destroying unions in the public sector. Like, he, he sure sure Foxconn will make a couple of jobs, but like a lot of them are going to be robots, and even if you do get the job, then there's a good chance you want want to jump into the net. Like, <laughs> and, it's, and, and on top, on that point, like, it's we were talking about immigration earlier. It's not the it's not the migrants taking our jobs. It's the robots. These da- like take it from somebody who works with computers like on a day to day basis. Like anyone's job could be gone within like the pat within a couple decades from now. Like look at what they're doing with self driving cars. That could. Look at that! Look at the grocery store. Okay, have- <laughs> so it's seven o'clock. So just any final points, and then we should probably wrap it up. Go, go check, go check out that town hall. The the Bernie Sanders town hall is on YouTube. Type in Bernie Sanders healthcare town hall. It's on. It's on the Young Turks. It's on this. Uh, this uh, now this, and I think it's on a couple other sites. There's a reason why the mainstream media did not want that to be on national TV. You need to go and see it. All right, uh, Nora. Any final thoughts before we wrap it up? And Den of Thieves is a good movie. <laughs> um, get involved, people. Do what you can. Uh, unfortunately, I was not contacted back by the people who organized the women's march, but you'll hear about it next time on the show. We talked. To, we, we mentioned briefly surveillance. Um, look up uh, Hack Blossom's uh, DIY guide to feminist cybersecurity. Ooh, I, it I could like uh, that. help protect your privacy if you're in a domestic violence situation, or if you're a feminist activist trying to. Avoid BS from the deep state. Don't get doxxed, people. Don't get. They, they do have a do, uh, doxing guide, like a guide for when you get doxxed as well. And that's uh, again, Hack Blossom, uh, feminist guide to cybersecurity. Well, thank you for sharing that information with the listeners, Nora. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in. This has been the Hood Rat Strategist Radio Program, only on eighty nine point one WIDR. Keep on fighting for that revolution solution.